Good evening. Uh, Tonight's Bible reading comes from James chapter 1, reading through to verse 8. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. This is God's word. I trust that you have been doing a little bit of forward reading in James. Um, it's, it's a great book, as all of Scripture is. Some of Scripture is easier to understand than others. This is not a difficult book to understand. Uh, it's a very straightforward book to understand. And let's ask for God's help. Our Father, we thank you for giving us a revelation of yourself in your word. We thank you that you came and revealed yourself in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the exact representation of you. We thank you that it is because Jesus Christ lived among us that we are able to know him and able to enter into a relationship with him. But we also recognize that it's because of Christ that the Holy Spirit came. And we thank you that the Holy Spirit is the one who enables us to understand your word, the one who gives insight where we lack, and the one who helps us not just to understand it, but to apply it. And so we pray this evening that you would speak to us again through your word by the Spirit for your glory. Amen. Now, if I may just start by giving a little brief background into the book of James. James is probably, you may know this, the first of all the books in the Bible to be completed. It's probably the earliest of all the books. It was written somewhere between AD 45 and AD 49. So when you think about that, that's not long after Jesus Christ ascended into heaven. There's quite a a, a close gap. In terms of to whom it is written, it is written to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Now, what that means is that James is writing primarily Uh, to Jews, although it's included of Gentiles, but he's thinking about those who have been in exile, those who are outside of Palestine, outside of Jerusalem, who have been spread far and wide. So it's a letter that goes out to a number of different churches. In terms of who writes James, it sounds almost obvious as to who writes James, James writes James. Ah, yes, okay. It's James, probably the Lord's brother, who writes James. Now, there's been a little bit of speculation and a bit of uh, argument about who the author is, but it's probably James the Righteous who is the Lord's brother. That's the most likely author of this book. Uh, In terms of its themes, it's very hard. James is one of those books that has got a whole lot of different subjects that he deals with. As almost he jumps from one to the next to the next, and he does it quite rapidly. So it's really difficult to find a unifying theme through James, but it is certainly a very practical book. So James deals with a whole range of practical issues in the Christian's life and basic issues that we deal with 
as Christians. So that gives us just a brief overview of the book of James, and we'll start, obviously, with the first few verses. So that would have been really verse 1. Recently, I was watching a movie, a sports movie. I, I, can't, I enjoy sports, and I was watching a movie about a basketball player, Bo Cruz. Now, it's not a true story, so don't get lost in going Googling to see whether or not it's a true basketball player. But the story was about a, a scout who was looking to add an under-23 player to the NBA, and he was busy out scouting certain names that had come to his attention. And while in Spain, he noticed this young man playing in an outdoor basketball court at night and recognized his talent and so wanted to get him over uh, to America and give him the opportunity to play in the NBA because he saw some potential. When he got him, and took him back to America. There were a lot of hoops he had to try and jump through. And initially, he was uh, rejected by the uh, um, basketball team that he was scouting for. Um, and in order to get this player prepared and get him up to scratch in order to show him and promote him, he had to get him fit. And he started with a, a player who was very unfit. And he had a particular run that he put him on. And there was a hill, and he said, by the time that I'm finished with you, you have to do this in less than, I think it was four minutes or whatever the, the minutes were, you have to be able to do this in less than that amount of time. And only when you can get to the top of this hill, and you're beating cyclists going up, will you be ready to uh, finally get onto the court and play some basketball. And as he begins and starts this first run, he gets probably a third of the way up and he's on his knees already, panting and uh, uh, struggling. And by the time he finally gets to the top, he's almost out on his feet and he's way over the time limit that is meant to get there. And he's gasping for air and he's in pain. And uh, every morning... At 6 o'clock in the morning or earlier than 6, he's up in the morning and redoing this run. And you can see the frustration and the agony and the pain and the suffering that he goes through. And, and you kind of, I kind of looked at it and I thought to myself, I don't know if I could be doing that at that time in the morning, particularly in the coldness of the morning that it was. And you see the pain etched on his face, but bit by bit, you see progress. Bit by bit, you see him getting fitter and fitter. And bit by bit, the time begins to come down. Until finally, after I don't know how many weeks it is, you see him begin right at the bottom. And as he begins to run, he overtakes a cyclist going up the hill. And you know, he's eventually getting to the point where his fitness is at the right level for him to participate. It's been an agonizing a number of weeks that he's been doing that. But he finally gets to the top in under the four minutes, I think it was four minutes or whatever the minutes were. The pain was worth the end result. The agony was worth finally achieving where he needed to be in order to get into the basketball league, in order to be able to play professional basketball. It was worth it. You and I lose sight of the goal to where we are heading. Our goal is not this world. Our goal is the world to come. And in order for us to get there, there is a lot of suffering and pain that we are going to endure. There's agony that we are going to experience. There's disappointments that we are going to experience. But in the end, one day when we look back, and we finally make it to our goal, which is to be with Christ, we will see all the benefits of the pain that we experienced in this world, and we will finally see the profit from pain that we have experienced as a result of what God put us through in the trials that you and I experience. And we will look at it and say, it was all worth it. 
And James begins with these readers probably dealing with some poor Christians who don't have a lot of money, don't have a lot of possessions, and are struggling through their trials as a result of their poverty. In fact, he's going to deal with it throughout the letter. And he wants to remind them of certain truths about trials that are going to encourage them and are going to help them and enable them to persevere because it'll all be worth it in the end. And that's the same for you and I. I know, I've been pastoring long enough to know that there are some of you who experience great agony and will experience great agony in this world. There are some times when trials become almost so great and burdensome for us that we want to throw in the towel and say, I can't do it anymore. There are times when I've been with people with tears running down their face because their 17-year-old has just died. And the pain is palpable. And there are times where no amount of words in situations like that can ever be satisfactory. And all one does is get alongside them and just be there. But it's into this kind of world that you and I live, into this kind of situation that you and I face that James wants to encourage us in certain ways. Now, for those of you who were here this morning, there is a bit of overlap. That's my disclaimer. Sorry about that. Firstly, the purpose of trials. Look at verses 2 and 3. The purpose of trials. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. So James begins reminding them that there are many different trials. In fact, it's an interesting word he used this when he uses face trials of many kinds. It's the word that speaks about Joseph's coat of varied colors. Remember when Joseph had that coat made and he went and boasted to his brothers and his brothers got so angry about the fact that he was his dad's favorite at that point that they plotted to bring harm to him. It's that same word, variegated, trials of many kinds. You know, in other words, James is not trying to limit the trials they are experiencing simply to poverty. That's what they're going through right now. But he recognizes there's a whole lot of other trials that they must experience. And the reason for that, the purpose of that, is to test their faith, is to put their faith under the microscope. It's in order for them to see what kind of faith they really have. Now, we mustn't mistake this. God is not confused about your faith. God knows exactly what kind of faith you've got. He doesn't sit in heaven and say, you know, there's Ian Dean. I better turn up the heat because I'm just not sure what kind of faith he has. When he turned up the heat on Job, he knew what kind of faith Job had. He said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Here is a man of unwavering faith. And Satan said, well, let me have a shot at him. And God says, you can have a shot at him, but you can't kill him. Because God knew that Job would come forth as gold. So that when we think about the testing of our faith, it's not so that God knows, but so that you know. It is in order to help us to see where we are in our relationship with God. And it's only in those times of affliction that the true nature and reality of our faith is exposed. In other words, it's for our benefit that God wants us to see what our faith really looks like. And here the, the emphasis is not on those who don't have faith. This is about those who have faith. So it's not that God is saying you have no faith. But what is the quality of your faith? And the way that's tested and examined and put under the microscope is through trials. It's the only way. Because when things are going well, it's easy to cruise. But when things are taken away from you, 
Well, that's different, isn't it? And we see that. Uh, the, the, the greatest example of that is, is Job. Job who loses his entire family. Just imagine that. You have a messenger knock on the door. By the way, Job, all of your children, all ten of them, dead in one foul swoop. Losing one child is tragic enough. But losing ten, that's a different story altogether. Job, knock, knock. Your crops have been wiped out. Job, knock, knock. Your cattle have been wiped out. Job is left with nothing. And yet, he maintains his faith throughout. And in spite of that, Job even gets to the point at the end of his testing where he says, because he's spoken quite a lot in answer to his friends, he says to the Lord, I said too much. For even Job, with that incredible faith, has been exposed with some cracks. And so it's important for us to see what kind of faith we really have. But moreover, it is not only designed to help us to understand what faith we have, but it's there to help us to persevere. Testing of your faith develops perseverance. Now that word, that little word there for perseverance, means fortitude, staying power, stickability, heroic endurance, under the most severest of conditions. So the perseverance that James is speaking about in faith is knowing how to endure, how to keep going when you are under the most extreme circumstances in your life. It speaks of people under great siege who do not lose heart, who do not throw in the towel, who do not begin to question God. How easy it is for us under stress to question God's goodness. Is God really good? Do we not have the unbeliever saying that when disaster strikes? He uses such a strong word to convey the sense of the intensity of the trials they are experiencing and saying under this intense pressure, this is going to help you to learn to persevere. Next time you receive a trial, having persevered through this one, you will be better equipped to persevere through the next one. So there is an ongoing progression here, an ongoing learning process. Charles Simeon was a pastor in the 1700s, born in 1759. He was sent to Eton School for education, but did not enjoy Eton. 1779, went to Cambridge University and studied at King's College. Easter morning, uh, 1779, peace flowed into his soul and he was converted. Now, three years later, he had almost no Christian fellowship in that place. There was an aloneness with God. This provided a solid foundation for his relationship with God. He obtained a, became a deacon in the Church of England in 1782. During six weeks, while the pastor was away, he preached. And the congregation tripled in size. Due to his preaching and visitation, he visited everyone in his congregation, knocked on their door, and asked after their welfare. He was appointed as a result of that to the Church of Holy Cambridge in 1782 and stayed there for 54 years. When he was appointed, most of the congregation was against it. They wanted another person appointed. The congregation on large were opposed to him, and the congregation locked their pews. In those days, you had pews, wooden pews, that were locked, and you paid for your pew. And so you got a key for it, and you unlocked it, and you sat in it where they locked the pews so that no one else could use them. 
Simeon installed new seating, but the wardens removed it. The rector they wanted appointed gave an afternoon lecture and the congregation turned up. This happened for a number of years while Simeon was still there. The wardens prevented him from starting an evening service by locking the church. He hired a building to hold a Bible study and prayer meeting. It soon grew, and he had to hire a bigger building. University students specifically came to church services to disrupt him. His peers avoided him. He was treated with contempt and derision. He was pouted with eggs while out walking. All of that persecution went on for 10 years. Just think about that for a minute. Ten years. Even after 38 years, he still had opposition. But eventually the tide turned. And he stayed there for 54 years. A testimony to a man who knew how to persevere under trial. It's one thing to have that happen over a period of six months or two or three or four or five years, but ten years of opposition, and yet he persevered. That's faith. That's strong faith. So don't fear trials. Don't look at it as something negative. Don't become anxious about them, but see it as a means by which God is in process and developing in you a more robust faith. Secondly, I want you to notice the approach to trials. Look at verse 2 and verses 5 to 8. Two things come out here. The approach to trials. Verse 2, consider it pure joy. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. We did a bit of this in the morning. Literally, it means all joy. Now, what I want you to understand is James is not trying to say that Joy is the only emotion in trials. Don't misunderstand him. He recognizes that alongside joy, there, there may be other emotions of sadness and disappointment, whatever the case may be. But he's calling these people to exhibit joy. Now, it's not the kind of joy that we celebrate on a birthday party. We all get together and we have a, a, a time of celebration because someone is having a birthday party. Neither is it the kind of joy that you may experience fleetingly when you buy a new car or a nice new cell phone, a mobile phone, and you get look at it and try all the new functions. It's not that kind of joy. Neither is it a joy that is celebrated when someone dies, as if that's, you know, that's great. Let's, let's throw a party. X, Y, and Z has died. So let's have a, a great big celebration. It's not talking about that either. It's not a masochist kind of joy. But rather, it is a joy that concentrates or focuses its energy on the relationship it has with Jesus Christ and the stability of that relationship so that it knows in all things it is secure in that relationship and it bows and submits to the sovereignty of God. It understands that God is sovereign over all circumstances so that whatever it experiences and to whatever extent it experiences it and however intense those trials are, it understands that they haven't happened by fluke, they haven't happened by accident, they've happened according to the divine, sovereign, overarching will of Almighty God. And so it surrenders itself to God's sovereignty. And it accepts good from God, and it accepts bad from God. Is that not what Job articulated? When his wife said to him, just deny, deny your faith, and it'll all go away. And Job says, shall we only accept that which is good from God and not accept that which is bad? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away, blessed be his name. And it's that sense of accepting that whatever it is we are going through, God is overarching and God remains in control. And the tragedy should never impinge on God's character. It should never cause us to doubt God's character or question God's goodness. 
should always remind us that God knows what he's doing. Thus, from writing from pr- prison in Philippians 4.4, 4, Paul is able to say, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. It recognizes that there is purpose and God is actively engaged in accomplishing his purposes. And understands how important it is in the midst of the greatest of trials to stop and thank God for his goodness. When he was seven years of age, His family forced him out of their home, and he went out to work. Think about that. Imagine being a seven-year-old, forced out of home, and having to work. When he was nine, his mother died. He lost his job as a store clerk when he was 20. He wanted to go to law school, but he didn't have an education. At age 23, he went into debt to be a partner in a small store. Three years later, the business partner died, and the resulting debt took years to repay. When he was 28, after courting a girl for four years, he asked her to marry him, and she turned him down. On his third try, um, so she turned around. On his third try, he was elected to Congress at age 37, but failed to be re-elected. His son died at four years of age. When this man was 45, he ran for the Senate and lost. At age 47, he ran for the vice presidency and lost. By age 51, he was elected president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. He learned to face discouragement and move beyond it. Did you know? that it was Abraham Lincoln who, in the midst of the Civil War in 1863, established the annual celebration of Thanksgiving. Lincoln had learned how important it is to stop and thank God in the midst of the greatest of difficulties. Why? Because he accepted God's sovereignty and rested in his relationship with Christ. That's the joy that is spoken about here. Second, pray. Pray. Look what he says, verses 5 to 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. Now, pray and ask for wisdom. Now, we need to understand that context is always important. A text without a context is a pretext. And so when we sometimes, in in prayer, I've heard it say, Lord, give us wisdom, and people quote from you. The wisdom that is spoken about you is a very special kind of wisdom. It's wisdom related specifically to the trials that we are experiencing. And we are to ask God as we experience trials, to know how to handle these trials. And God says that he will bless us by giving us the right kind of wisdom to handle the trials. Now, the wisdom that is spoken about here is not some theoretical kind of knowledge, but it's really the Proverbs kind of wisdom, the wisdom that is there for practical day-to-day living. And so he prays, and James says, pray and go to God and say to him, look, Lord, I'm going through this really difficult time. I'm not sure whether I should turn this way or that way or follow this path or that path. Now, Lord, help me to make the right choices. Help me to make the right decisions in this trial. Lead and direct me. Show me what is going to be best in this situation. Do I close up my business because I'm in debt? Do I sell it? How do I handle this? Lord, I'm going through a marital difficulty, and there's problems within our relationship. Lord, I'm not sure how to handle this. Give me wisdom to know how best to handle this. Lord, I'm still single, and I'd love to be married. Show me the best path path to follow. How do I handle my singleness, Lord? 
And so as the problems come, we ask God to give us wisdom, but notice what he says. Very important. He says, God says to us, ask without finding fault and it will be given to him. But when he asks, verse 6, he must believe and not doubt. Because he who doubts is like the wave of a sea blown and tossed by the wind. Now, when he talks about that, this is not God saying that we should never have any doubts whatsoever. That's just not possible, is it, as a human? Because all of us, from time to time, may pray and wonder whether or not it's going to be answered. Even Abraham laughed when he was told at his ripe old age he was going to have a child. Now, here what is being emphasized is the ongoing attitude towards the praying. In other words, if we are characterized by consistent doubting in our faith, and our faith is lived in this ongoing doubt, that is the doubt that James is speaking against. He's saying, don't come to God if you are constantly going between these two sides, believing, not believing, believing, not believing, living like a Christian, not living like a Christian. In other words, there's a comprehensiveness to this that James is speaking about. It's not just bound up with prayer, though it is. It's also bound up with how the Christian is living their lives. And so if their faith statement, if their, their faith expression is one that is constantly vacillating between two extremes, James says, you're not going to get any answer if you operate like that. You are a double-minded man. You need to make up your mind. You need to decide what you believe. And now that you make up your mind, if you believe and you trust God, then God will respond by answering. And then God will give you wisdom in trials. And then God will lead you and direct you. And the issue is not that we might have a nagging doubt here and there, but whether or not we are characterized by doubt all the time. And James says, if that's you, you're not going to get an answer. God wants us to humble ourselves before him. He wants us to come with nothing in our hands. And say, Lord, I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know how you're going to resolve this situation. I know that you can resolve this situation. There's part of me that may just fleetingly doubt whether or not it is going to be resolved. But Lord, I believe you can resolve it. And therefore, Lord, I'm going to pray that you would help me to know how best to address this particular situation. How do I approach it, Lord? And I'm going to trust, in spite of sometimes the fleeting doubts I may have, I'm going to trust that you will guide me and you will lead me and then rest in him. And do so expectantly for God will bring an answer at the right time. Notice else what else he says in relation to that. That man, verse 7, should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded man, unstable in all he does. Unstable in the entire framework of his faith, not just in the praying. So can I encourage you that what James is saying here is that your life needs to be characterized by believing when you pray not doubting when you pray. And it needs to be lived out in such a way that you are single-minded in your faith so that your faith is not constantly being wavering between having and not having faith, walking in obedience, not walking in obedience. There needs to be a single-minded focus. And that man, says James, and that woman, says James, will receive an answer from God. And they will know the wisdom that comes from him. And then thirdly, very quickly, notice the benefit of trials. Verse 4. What is the benefit? Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be 
mature and complete, not lacking anything. James tells us that it makes us complete people spiritually, that God is in process of fashioning you after the Lord Jesus Christ. He is molding you, making you, removing the dross, and causing you to become more and more conformed to the image of Christ. And trials are one of the ways in which he accomplishes his purpose. And so God is in process in preparing you one day for heaven. And part of that preparation process is that God makes you more and more like himself now. And he does that through trials. In other words, you persevere in trials in order that God's purposes may be completed in you. And God's purpose is to make you like His Son. And He does that in three specific ways. Firstly, it refers to character, obedience to all that God says. God is conforming you more and more so that you obey Him, that you live according to the will of God, that you walk in the footsteps of Jesus, that obedience flows out of your relationship with Christ, that it doesn't become this great big effort. It's not that obedience is going to make you more acceptable to God. It doesn't. You're acceptable already because of the work of Christ. But rather, as God shapes us, he begins to burn away those impurities. And as those impurities get burnt away, so we become more like Jesus. That's his end goal. Second, it refers to the divine pattern. It is not simply a human endeavor. In other words, we divinely rely upon the grace of God. For God strengthens us in trials, and He enables us to walk the path that He has laid out before us. And He doesn't put out a path before us unless He equips us in order to be able to handle that path and all the obstacles that lie before us. It is the divine pattern of God to shape us by bringing those trials into our lives and enabling us through His grace to handle them by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, There is an end times aspect to this. It looks forward to the end times when finally you get to see God. That process will reach its completion. You're never going to be fully complete in this world. There is no such thing as a perfect human being in this world. We are always going to have flaws. But hopefully by the time you hit age 80... You're better than you were when you were 20, and there are less of those things present in your life because God has been shaping you, molding you, and removing things. But all of that will finally fall away, and you will experience the perfection that Christ has already given to you through His death and through His righteousness on that day when Christ returns. And then all of that will be seen in its full splendor and glory. When he comes, we are told in 1 John 3, verse 2, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is when Christ appears. And thus, as we go through trials, remember God's making you more holy. He's making you more like his son. So that as he sends you out into the world, and as you encounter unbelievers, you leave behind the fragrance of Jesus. And God uses trials to accomplish that purpose. I can close with an illustration. Hopefully that will bring it home. Some years ago in Dublin, a company of women met uh, in a Bible study. 
One of them was puzzled by the words of Malachi 3.3. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. After some discussion, the committee was appointed to call, must have been Baptists, because Baptists always appoint committees, appointed a committee to call a silversmith and learn what they could on the subject. The silversmith readily showed them the process. But sir, said one, do you sit while the refining is going on? Oh yes, indeed, he said. I must sit with my eyes steadily fixed on the surface. For if the time necessary for refining is exceeded in the slightest degree, the silver is sure to be damaged. Once they saw the beauty and comfort of the scripture. As they were leaving, the silversmith called after them, Oh, one thing more. I only know when the process is complete by seeing my own image reflected in the silver. That's what Jesus wants to see in you. He wants to see his own image reflected in you. So instead of viewing trials as bad and negative and horrible and we want to avoid them at all costs, embrace them when they come. As painful as they are, as hard as it is to endure, allow God to do his refining work in you. And remember through those trials that Jesus is making you into his image so that he might be seen by all who encounter you. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word this evening. So may, may you help us, we pray, to view our trials in a positive way, not negatively. And we ask that as painful as they may get and be, that we would allow you, by your Spirit, to do your work and to find comfort and joy in knowing that you are still on the throne. And you are overseeing all that happens to us. And you will not allow us to be stretched beyond what we can bear. And that as you stretch us, you are busy in the process of refining us. That we might better reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. For his sake we pray. Amen. Let's stand.